Paul Watson is one of the most controversial figures in the environmental movement. A believer in direct action as opposed to protest. A man who believes that if the governments of the world will not protect the seals and the whales, then it's up to people like him. He confronts Japanese whalers in the Antarctic and Canadian sealers off the coast of Newfoundland. He heads the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and stars in the Animal Planet series Whale Wars. Canadian government ministers have called him a terrorist. Time magazine named him one of its environmental heroes of the 20th century. I visited Paul Watson in July 2009 near his home in Friday Harbor, Washington. My first question was about a close encounter with a sperm whale, an encounter that changed Paul Watson's life. 1975, uh, we put together the first Greenpeace campaign to uh, protect whales. Uh, we were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, so we thought that all we had to do was put ourselves between the harpoon and the, and the whale, and uh, that would stop them from firing. And so in June of 1975, uh, Bob Hunter and I found ourselves in a small inflatable boat in front of a Soviet harpoon vessel. It was about 60 miles off the coast of Northern California. Very rough water, and uh, as this 150-foot uh, vessel was chasing us, in front of us were eight uh, magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life and uh, they kept on their tail and I then began to block uh, the harpooner's aim and this worked for about 25 minutes until the, uh, the captain came down the catwalk and uh, screamed into the ear of the harpooner and then he looked at us, smiled and brought his finger across his neck and that's when I realized Gandhi wasn't going to work for us that day. And, uh, a few minutes later there was this horrendous explosion and the uh, harpoon flew over our head and uh, the line just whipped down like a sword right into the water right beside us. It just nearly missed us. And the harpoon impacted into the backside of one of the whales and it was a female in the pod and, and she turned on her side and screamed. It was a very human-like scream. It was very eerie. And suddenly the largest whale in the pod hit the water with his tail and disappeared. He swam up right underneath of us and we turned and saw him hurl himself out of the water, throw himself straight at the harpooner on, the, on that Soviet vessel to protect his pod and uh, they were ready for him and with an unattached harpoon the uh, harpooner pulled the trigger and at point blank range sent that harpoon into the head of this, uh, of this bull sperm whale. And he screamed and fell back in the water, he's thrashing in agony on the surface and uh, it was only about 20-25 feet from us and suddenly I caught his eye and he looked at us and then he dove and then I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight at us real fast. And, he came up and out of the water at an angle so that the, you know, the next move would be really to fall right down on top of us, to, to crush us. And as his eye rose up out of the water, an eye the size of my fist, I looked into that eye and what I saw there really changed my life forever because I, I saw understanding. The whale understood what we were trying to do because I could see the effort he made. His muscles were, were clenching and he pulled back and uh, I saw his, him slide back into the sea as I disappeared beneath the surface and, and he died. Could have killed us and made a decision not to do so. So I feel personally indebted to that whale for the fact that I'm still alive today. But the other thing I saw was pity, and not for himself, but, uh, but for us, that we could commit such an act of blasphemy, that we could take life so callously, so thoughtlessly. And, and then I began, why, I began to think, why were we killing these whales? The Soviets were killing sperm whales for spermaceti oil, which is used for lubricating high heat-resistant machinery. And one of the things that it was used for is the manufacture of intercontinental ballistic missiles. I said, here we are destroying this incredibly sensitive, socially complex, intelligent creature for the purpose of making a, a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's, that's when it struck me that we're insane. Mm -hmm. The human race is insane. And from that moment on, I said to myself that I'm going to do what I'm doing for whales, for the creatures of the sea, not for people. And uh, so that's, we're really beyond criticism because we don't care what people think about what we do. Uh, we're there to defend our clients, and our clients are whales and sharks and seals and fish. But it wasn't just whales. By the time you were also into defending seals and, and even, even creatures like sharks that a lot of people find a lot less sympathetic. Well, it goes back with me for, uh, to when I was 10 years old. I was raised in uh, St. Andrews, uh, New Brunswick. And, uh, you know, when I was 10, I... Uh, spent the summer swimming with uh, these beavers, especially this one little beaver that he used to play around with. And, uh, and then the next year, when I was 11, I went back and I, I couldn't find any of them. And I started asking questions and found that trappers had taken the beavers out the winter before. And I became pretty angry. I was actually a member of the Kindness Club, which was set up by Albert Schweitzer. And uh, Ida Fleming, who was the wife of the premier of New Brunswick at the time, she was the head of the Kindness Club. And, and so I uh, was very much aware of, you know, what 
being, uh, the whole thing about being kind to animals and everything. So uh, when I was 11, I began to walk the trap lines in, uh, in uh, to release animals from the trap lines uh, in and around St. Stephen, St. Andrews. And uh, then I began to destroy the traps. So I really started as a, <laughs> an uh, interventionist, really, when I was about 11. Later, Ida Fleming described me as a hitman for the Kindness Club. <laughs> but uh, so it goes really bad. So back, in fact, when we set up uh, the Greenpeace Foundation, I was the youngest founding member of Greenpeace. I was 18 at the time, and uh, in 1969, when we set up this group called the Don't Make a Wave Committee, and uh, everybody was there because they were anti-war, uh, and I was there for for a completely different reason. Amchitka was a wildlife preserve, and they wanted to blow a five megaton bomb up underneath of it. So I think I was the only person who was there for that reason. And uh, so that's the reason I uh, got together with them to and join the first campaign to go up and uh, protest uh, the, kill, uh, you know, the detonation of that bomb in, in the Aleutian Islands. And uh, in fact, it was a successful. We didn't stop that test, but we stopped all others' tests because of the publicity that was attracted to it. And you know, Greenpeace was set up um, really by journalists and uh, broadcasters, like people like Ben Metcalf and Robert Hunter and that. And I was a communications major at the time of Simon Fraser. So what I saw there was um, the establishment of an organization that really understood the context of the culture that we live in, which was as a media culture. And therefore, we had to do these things in order to attract attention, in order to get, uh, to get our message across. As uh, Marshall McLuhan said at the time, you know, the medium is the message. So therefore, we were very much aware of the power of television and film radio and, and, and uh, print uh, media at the time. <coughs> yeah, the, the Greenpeace was, was tremendously good at that sort of thing. I, rem I remember actually, uh, I, uh, I spent one day with Homer Stevens on the Phyllis Cormack in Vancouver Harbor protesting against, against with the Don't Make a Wave Committee. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and it was, yeah, it was really effective. You know. So that, but that's, uh, I, I, I think you're right. I think at the time that people were really, it was really an anti-war movement more than an anti-environmental uh, issue. It came together from two different groups, the Quakers and the Sierra Club. I was a member of the Sierra Club at the time. And so the Green came from the Sierra Club, the Peace came from the Quakers, so it was the joining of the force. At one of the early meetings, uh, uh, it was actually called the Don't Make a Wave Committee, and I think it was in 1970, somebody left the meeting and said, uh, Peace, and uh, Bill Darnell, who was the cook on the first boat, he said, uh, make it a Greenpeace, and uh, I think it was Bob Hunter who said, well, that's a good name for the boat, let's call it the, the, the Greenpeace. So the boat came first, and then it was the Greenpeace 2, T-O-O, -O, and those are the two ships that went up to Hamchick. I was on the Greenpeace 2. And uh, then in seven, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, <coughs> in 1972, we changed the name to, um, to the Greenpeace Foundation. We actually took the name Foundation from Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy in that story. And, it, and so the, the the story is sort of repeated with Sea Shepherd, right? I mean, you have you have the boat, and then you name the organization, and you have the same thing with Sea Shepherd. You have the boat, and you name the organization. Yes, actually, we got the boat, and then named it Sea Shepherd. And in fact, uh, it goes uh, very much to the story of the Foundation Trilogy by Asimov, because in the in, the, in there you have the foundation, then you have the second foundation. And the second foundation is smaller than the foundation, but it keeps the foundation on track. It, it's a it, it's consistent with its original values. So what happened with Sea Shepherd is that all of the original Sea Shepherd people, except for a few, all the original Greenpeace people, I mean, became part of Sea Shepherd. Bob Hunter, and Rod Marinine, and Al Johnson, uh, all of them became Sea Shepherd people. In fact, uh, all of the original Greenpeace people can't, aren't even welcome in a Greenpeace office today. Got taken over by the, by the bureaucrats and the fundraisers. So it really lost uh, you know, its original meaning. In fact, last month, Greenpeace actually officially removed me as one of their co-founders on their website. They now have, they've denounced, they've, uh, they said Paul Watson was not one of the co-founders, he was just an early member. So they've completely changed their entire history to, in order to do that, which is sort of reminds me a lot of the Bolsheviks used to do. It does, it does. <coughs> but my Greenpeace uh, membership number is 007. <coughs> so, sorry about that. Is this, uh, this going to be a problem? Do you want to uh, take a pause and find something to drink somewhere? Oh, no, it's fine. Not an easy matter. But, uh, and, but you, the other thing is that uh, in terms of keeping Greenpeace on track, or in terms of keeping the environmental movement to some extent on track, um, you're, you, you don't regard yourself as a protester. I've never regarded myself as a, as a protester. I, I think protesting is a very submissive sort of thing. It's like, please, please, please don't kill the whales. You know? And of course they do it anyway. Uh, I think that you have to go in there and uh, and be very aggressive, but at the same time mindful that you stay within the law and that you don't hurt anybody. Those are the two things that I think we have to be consistent with, and if we do, 
then I don't see how anything else can be is really is really wrong. As long as you're not hurting anybody, not breaking the law, what else is there that you're doing that's wrong or unethical? I've always looked on Sea Shepherd as an anti-poaching organization. That we're we're opposing the poachers uh, of marine wildlife and we're destroying marine ecosystems. And so uh, we're an interventionist organization, not a protest organization. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. So you. Let me let me just push that one a little, little step further, though, because I understand you have some real difficulties with the view that only sovereign nations can enforce the the conservationist ethic at, at uh, beyond national boundaries. Well, we have all of the uh, laws and regulations and treaties we need to protect the oceans. They're all there in place. The problem is there's a lack of economic and uh, political will to to enforce them. So it's really the oceans are a wild west sort of situation where the law is there, but there is no marshal. And uh, because governments just refuse to live up to their responsibilities. So my view on that is that if the government's not going to do it, then we as a non-government organization can intervene. And we can do so by virtue of what's called the United Nations World Charter for Nature, which was ratified by the UN General Assembly in 1982. And the UN Charter for Nature states in its section on implementation that any individual or non-government organization is empowered to uphold international conservation law and I've used that in our defense in the past. And uh, the UN has never challenged me on that uh, because that is what the UN Charter for Nature states. And in fact, in Section 21E, it says specifically in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So um, that's where we operate primarily is in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And that's true, really. There is no jurisdiction in the Southern Ocean except for little patches where New Zealand and Australia have some would, would have some, in theory, some authority. Well, all the signatories to the Antarctic Treaty should be intervening. All the signatories to the regulations of the International Whaling Commission should be intervening. The United States could shut down Japanese and Norwegian whaling tomorrow by simply implementing the Packwood, Magnuson, and Pelly Amendments to the U.S. Department of Commerce regulations that state that if, if anybody doesn't abide by the IWC regulations, they will have their fish products embargoed into the country. And every year for the last 22 years, the President has uh, discriminated on the application of the law and has chosen instead to send a strongly worded, in his words, letter of protest to Japan and Norway, which they promptly ignore and carry on with business as usual. The problem is, is that governments are more interested in defending trade relations than they are with upholding the law. And uh, as long as that's happening, then they're going to get away with it. But the, uh, the Japanese are targeting endangered species in an established whale sanctuary in Antarctica in violation of the regulations of the IWC, in violation of the, of the Antarctic Treaty, in violation of CITES, in violation of uh, Australian law. In fact, Australia has ruled that uh, taking whales in the Australian Antarctic ter Territory cannot take place, and they have uh, warned uh, Japan to stay out of there. And then when Japan continued, they cited them for contempt of a court order. So they're actually in contempt of an Australian federal court order. So uh, they're, they're basically, they're, they're pretty blatantly criminals. The only difference between a whaler in Antarctica and an elephant poacher in East Africa is that the uh, poachers in Africa are black and poor. But yet, yet, for all of that, I mean, you had that situation with the Kaiko Maru, where, where you had basically cornered one of the whaling ships and were asking the Australians or New Zealanders to take some action. And we they did. didn't do it. And they did and they won't. We know that they won't. I'm, uh, Peter Garrett, the Minister of the Environment for Australia, in September of two, 2007, excuse me, <coughs> in September 2007, Peter Garrett uh, stood up and admonished the Liberal government under John Howard, and he said, uh, he said the, a Labour government would end whaling, a Labour government would uh, bring uh, Japan to court, a Labour government would send a vessel down to intervene, and uh, the, he said the Liberal government is nothing more than smoke and mirrors, all talk, no action. Well, two years later, he may as well have been talking about himself. I mean, he hasn't done anything he promised to do. In fact, the former Minister of the Environment, Ian Campbell, is now on the Sea Shepherd Advisory Board because Ian said that uh, the government's not going to do anything. The International Whaling Commission is not going to do anything. The only thing that's going to stop them is what we're doing. And he understands what our approach is, is we're speaking the language they understand, economics. We're going to cost them more money every year than they make. We're going to make sure their losses exceed their profits. And uh, so our objective is simply to sink the Japanese whaling fleet economically to drive them into bankruptcy. We've cut their quotas in half for three years. They haven't made any money. If we keep this pressure on, I think we can end it. How have you cut the quotas? How did, how did that work? They set their own quotas. Uh, this year, I think it's 935 minke whales and 50 uh, fin whales, although they're trying to throw humpbacks into that. 
but under pressure from the U.S. they haven't gotten humpbacks. But the fin whale is an endangered species, and yet uh, we've, uh, they've had a quota of 100 over the last two years. They've only taken one, so we've managed to save 99 fin whales, and we've cut their minke whale quotas in half. And uh, they're getting more aggressive every year, and it's a very difficult thing for us because they're trying to kill us out there. And if they do, their government will defend and justify their actions. We have to go in and intervene, making sure that we don't injure anybody, so it's completely defensive. And uh, Because if we ever injured anybody, uh, we would be condemned by our governments. There's no way they would justify it. So it's a very one-sided uh, battle in, in that sense, so we have to be very, very careful. But the, your government's willing to come to your defense if the Japanese injured you. I don't expect the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand to come to our defense. In fact, they're continuously condemning us. The only reason that we continue to operate in Australia is because of the overwhelming support of the Australian people. The government's very hostile, but the Australian people wouldn't tolerate uh, the government banning us. Last year, for instance, Japan demanded that Australia ban us from their ports. And there's no way that the Australian government is going to ban a ship named the Steve Irwin with a one-third Australian crew from coming into Australia for, de for, for defending Australia's whales. And so uh, it was very silly of the Japanese. You don't make a diplomatic demand unless you know the answer in advance. So I'm surprised that they made that demand. They must be finding you very frustrating, though. Yeah. The Japanese government's extremely angry, so much to the point that they've actually uh, condemned me as an international terrorist. So I'm being stopped at the borders and, and being told that. And uh, apparently it doesn't mean much because uh, Interpol doesn't uh, red light any, anybody for political uh, issues. You have to actually have committed a crime. We haven't done that. Yeah, I was going to say it's hard to, hard to be considered a terrorist if you haven't committed an act of terror. <laughs> yeah, but terrorism, it doesn't matter whether you're saving whales or running for president of the United States. If people don't like you, they're going to be calling you a terrorist. It's become the, uh, the catchword for condemning anybody you disagree with. Yeah, it has. Yeah. I want to go back to the beginning. Tell, me about, tell us about the Sierra, the Sierra episode, because this is your, number one, this is your first ship. And, and where does she come from? And how does, how does a guy who's basically been turfed from Greenpeace wind up with a ship that he can put to that kind of use? I actually wasn't uh, thrown out of Greenpeace. In 1977, that was the year that Bridget Bardot went to the ice, uh, I had a run-in with Patrick Moore, who was vice president of Greenpeace at the time, and he was gonna, wanted to go to the ice with Bridget Bardot, and I said, well, no, <laughs> you're not a photographer, you're not a cameraman, I'm not gonna waste a spot in the, in the helicopter. And he said, well, let me put it this way, unless I go there, unless I get a seat in that helicopter, when I become president, you're out the door. And I said, no, let me put it this way, you're not getting in that helicopter. So he didn't, and he was very angry, and he became president of Greenpeace in June of 77. And then he called for a vote and voted me off the board. Uh, he said that I had stolen property and destroyed that property because I pulled a club out of a sealer's hand and threw it in the water. And I said, well, if I had to do the same thing over again, I would do the same thing over again. I was there to save seals, not to watch them be killed. And I said, I didn't hurt the man. He says, yeah, but you stole the man's property. I says, I don't regard a seal club as anybody's property. It's a, you know, it's a weapon. And uh, anyway, they voted me off the board, but I was not kicked out of Greenpeace. I could have continued to work for Greenpeace. I resigned from Greenpeace because I said, look, I can't do anything in this organization. So I set up my own organization. Didn't have any money or anything. But what happened is that I made an appeal to Cleveland Amory of the Fund for Animals in New York. And uh, Cleveland was very much interested in opposing the seal hunt. And uh, I gave him two proposals. One, we can skydive in there and protest it. <laughs> and he thought that was too dangerous. Or I, we can get a ship and nobody had taken a ship in there before. So he said, go get a ship. So I went to England and found uh, the first Sea Shepherd vessel, bought it for $120,000 in the hull. It was one of the recently decommissioned Cod War vessels. And uh, I had a ship, but I didn't have any money. Then I went to the RSPCA in London, and they funded the actual first SEAL campaign. They gave me 50,000 pounds for that. So that's how we got our start, was uh, thanks to the Fund for Animals and the RSPCA, which, by the way, were both very conservative organizations. So I'm too radical for Greenpeace, but I'm now being supported by two of the more conservative organizations. And um, then after that, it was pretty much on my own, which is good. They gave me the seeds to, uh, you know, to, to, to go, the, go from there. And we built up the organization very slowly because I didn't want to repeat the same mistakes as Greenpeace. My organization was never going to be taken over by fundraisers and bureaucrats. So we don't do direct mail. We don't do all those kind of things that people use to raise their money. Because Greenpeace now, I think, spends 70% of its money raising more money. We're not going to do that. In fact, we still don't spend money to raise money. So it's always been a word of mouth organization. But what that does is gives me a very loyal membership. And presumably a fairly small one? <coughs> Excuse me. 
our membership is relatively small in comparison to the big organizations, but I don't want a big organization. I don't want to be IFAW or Greenpeace or World Wildlife Fund. I want an organization I can control and can make a decision on, the, on you know, in, in an instant. We can take, we don't have to have committee meetings to get involved. If something happens, we can respond immediately. And I guess people might say it's a bit of a dictatorship, and I, I suppose it is. We run the organization like we run a ship with a captain in command. But it's now an international organization, and uh, I would actually delegate that authority to the chapter heads in their countries. So they can, uh, in Brazil, for instance, they make decisions without having to consult with me. As long as they adhere to the basic rules, which are very simple. One, don't break the law. Two, don't hurt anybody. Those are the only two rules. Oh, three, uh, don't get involved with bureaucracy and fundraising. And uh, those are the three rules. And if, as long as they adhere to, th to that, they're free to make the, the decisions in the field. Excuse me. <coughs> they're free to make the decisions in the field. Um, and, and always the focus is on the oceans. We decided that uh, we had to specialize. You know, I, I was involved in, I was opposing elephant poaching in East Africa, opposing the wolf hunt up in northern British Columbia, but I felt that, you know, this is just being spread out too much. You know, we can't do everything. And so I decided to just focus on marine wildlife species as a marine wildlife conservation organization. Even that, that's big, pretty big. But, um, but I really believe that the strength of the conservation movement or the environmental movement lies not in big organizations, but in the um, actions and acts of uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals and small NGOs. That's where the passion lies in this movement. And when you really look at it, that's where the changes are happening. It's because of Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall and Baruti Galdikas and uh, David Wingate in Bermuda, and I could go on and on and on about all of the individuals that have made a difference. When you really look at it, that's where the change comes from. You know, slavery wasn't ended by the U.S. government. It was ended because of the passion of Wilberforce and Douglas. You know, and uh, women got the vote in the United States, not because of Woodrow Wilson, who was opposed to it right up until the point it, it was achieved, and then he took credit for it. But it was all those women who went to jail and uh, were, were being beaten up for, for their beliefs. It's the individuals that make a difference. And governments, as far as I'm concerned, governments cause problems. They don't solve problems. And if you really want to solve problems, you've got to look to, to people. It's the Mandelas and the and the uh, Martin Luther Kings and the Mahatma Gandhis that, that make the difference. You've also had your, uh, uh, your your time in jail and your occasions of being beaten up. Tell me a bit about that, because you've had some pretty violent reactions to your actions. I've been arrested many times. I haven't been convicted of any felony ever, but, uh, but I have spent time in jail, which I've always found very interesting experience. I don't think that anybody really can, you know, be a good uh, advocate for a cause unless they've actually <laughs> gone to jail and uh, had that experience. In fact, I've never been afraid of dying, but I was always afraid of going to prison. <laughs> so, but I've got to overcome that, which I think was a personal triumph. 80 days in Norway, right? 60 days in the Netherlands, uh, um, some brief period in St. John's in Newfoundland, right? Uh, those are the ones that I've just sort of come across in a, in a quick sort of scan. So you see, <coughs> plus being beaten up by sealers in, uh, in the Magdalens. Well, I never spent time in Norway. I did spend uh, 80 days in the Netherlands, but that's like staying in a five-star hotel for a few months. I mean, going to, if you're going to go to prison anywhere, go to the Netherlands. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of the most civilized prison systems I've ever seen. I mean, it's not even illegal to escape from prison in the Netherlands. The warden was telling me, well, we feel that that's a natural instinct of humans, and we're not going to punish you for it. Uh, and so it was actually quite comfortable, and I turned it into a campaign. We actually, I was... Uh, described as being the only political prisoner in the in the Netherlands and I turned it in I got all I got more people in the Netherlands aware of illegal Norwegian whaling by being in prison than by anything else I could could do and I was actually holding weekly press conference and the warden was serving tea and and cookies to the to the reporters <coughs> um, as far as being I've been beaten up a few times I've been shot at of course uh, but uh, it was a pretty interesting situation in the Magdalen Islands because we didn't go there to protest. We went there to offer an alternative industry. I came up with this idea of developing a non-lethal, cruelty-free form of sealing by simply brushing the, the molten seal hairs off of the baby seals. The hairs are very similar to eiderdown in how they, uh, they can actually, they're an insulating fiber because they're hollow hair follicles. And I had a company in Germany that would buy all of the hair that we could comb. And uh, in 95, I hired um, two uh, two sealers, uh, English sealers from the northern end of the Magdalens to go out and I uh, hired them to, to do this and they thought it was a good idea. So we went back the next year and uh, I brought with me Martin Sheen to publicize this and uh, the sealers had a meeting. They all got drunk 
and they came out and said, oh, we don't want anything to do with a faggoty idea like brushing seals. Seals are meant to be clubbed. And then they attacked the hotel or the motel we were staying in. They stormed into the lobby, started smashing things up. I was in my room with a, the chief of police and a police officer. And I said, what are you going to do when they come through that door? And the guy looked at me and says, I can do nothing. I live here. I said, oh, well, great. Jeez, that's wonderful. So they, anyway, they smashed the door down with an axe, and I got into the next room, and I barricaded that, but they smashed that door down in an axe, and about 30 of them poured into the room, and, you know, they were a little stunned because it was a little 30 against me, and one of them came forward and punched me in the side of the head, but I took him down with a stun gun, Then I took another guy down with a stun gun, and that sort of confused them because every time they approached me, they were, they were falling to the ground, and they couldn't figure that out, but that bought me enough time for the uh, Quebec police to come in, and uh, they hauled me out, and I was being like hauled through a gauntlet, being jabbed and kicked as I, I was being hauled through. Took me to the airport, threw me, threw me on a plane, and flew me to New Brunswick without any ID, without a coat, and without any money. They just told me to get out of the out of the out of the province. So I thought that was a little strange. I mean, this is what the police are about. Is in fact, one of the police officers came over to me and says, "You you hit those guys with a stun gun. Those are illegal in Canada." I said, "Well, then arrest me. I don't care." I said, "If I didn't have this stun gun, I'd be dead." <laughs> So uh, anyway, I was beaten uh, quite severely, but uh, no broken bones, nothing, nothing too uh, dramatic. So when it comes around to, um, so essentially you're all, you're kind of arrested and expelled from the Magdalens uh, without any charges, without any anything, you just packed on a plane and sent away. Yeah. Um, something similar happened with the Farley Mowat. Tell me about that. Well, I sent the Farley Mowat in uh, in um, 1988 to get evidence on to back up the European Parliament's bill to ban uh, seal product. So I sent them in in 2008, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't on the ship for a very good reason, because I was Canadian. I wanted this uh, European officers, European ship, European crew, and because uh, I wanted to make a big issue about this in Europe. And uh, so I said Alex Cornelison, who's from the Netherlands, as captain, uh, Peter Hammerstedt, who's from Sweden, as first officer. And uh, we went in there, and um, they actually didn't do anything but show up in the ice, and Canada just went ballistic over the fact that we were there. Uh, attacked the ship with a, a Royal Canadian Mounted Police SWAT team with machine guns, uh, boarded the vessel, seized it. They didn't arrest any of uh, the crew except for the two officers, but they seized all their property. Uh, they, they just uh, confiscated their property, everything from their iPods to their cameras to whatever. And then they arrested uh, the two officers and deported them right away after charging them. Said they couldn't come back to Canada again. And they said, well, how are we supposed to attend the trial? And the fisheries guy said, well, that's not, a, that's not of our concern. And um, then they uh, took the ship, but we were never charged. There was no charges laid against the ship, no charges laid against Sea Shepherd, the owners of the ship. And the ship was just kept there. And um, then, they, then they sent me a letter saying, you have three days to remove the pollutants off the ship or else you could be fined $1 million. I said, what pollutants? the oil and the, and the fuel. And of course, I was in Antarctica at the time. I said, well, that's physically impossible. I can't do that. So what they did was they went in and they pumped it all out and sold it and kept the money. So as far as I'm concerned, it was a blatant act of piracy. They stole our ship. They stole the crew's property. It was never returned to them. Uh, then they ordered the ship sold without any hearing, without any court uh, case. It was There was no due process of law. They simply seized our property without due process of law. They seized the property of 18 crew members, or 20 crew members actually, if you include the officers. 20 crew members without due process of law. Their cameras, their everything. I mean, this is out and out theft. And therefore, that's when I, when I said it was an act of piracy by the Canadian uh, government. That's in fact what it was. Uh, and that's why I reacted. I bailed my crew uh, out with uh, doubloons, which it, which is what I call the two two dollar coin doubloons, and uh, put them in uh, you know five thousand two dollar coin pieces, <laughs> just to illustrate that point. And then my uh, two officers uh, couldn't show up, and they had their bail confiscated, and were told. And the trial went ahead, and they were charged with failure to appear. And I said, well, how could they possibly appear when they're not allowed into the country by immigration? And the Justice Department's attitude towards that is, that, well, that's not our problem. <laughs> you know? So you, they're, they're really, there's a lot of political intervention going on here. This is not the way a justice system should work. In fact, we were constantly having the, the, this contradiction in Canadian law. I remember when I came in with a ship uh, under the Canadian flag in Halifax in uh, 2000, and uh, I think it was in 2005, I believe. And, uh, the Transport Canada said, you're in violation, you have to have a Canadian resident as captain, and you're not a resident of Canada. I said, but Revenue Canada says I have to have a non-resident as captain because this is a non-duty paid vessel. 
and transport said, well, we don't care what Revenue Canada says, you're in violation of the transport. And I said, well, then I have no choice but to break the law. Because if I abide by what you say, I'm breaking Revenue Canada's law. And I'm saying, let me see, if it's a choice between Revenue Canada and transport, I'm going to go with Revenue. Because they probably could be more nasty than you are. <laughs> but, but um, you know, these are the, we're constantly getting this kind of harassment. Yeah. <coughs> you've, you've said um, several times in the past that, uh, um, that somebody who's uh, done an activist should be prepared to bend the truth or make up statistics or... Um, do whatever is necessary in the circumstances, as Ronald Reagan used to do. Um, when and how does that happen? Well, I said that at the time almost sarcastically because uh, I, we had a president that uh, would do that regularly and everybody seemed to think that was okay. So I figured if the president of the United States could do this, why can't anybody else? Because, you know, they try to get you on like radio shows or something, they try to get you on, uh, catch you on facts and figures and statistics, which nobody really has access to right at that time. So I just said, oh, I'll just make them up. President of the United States does it, you can do it too. <laughs> yeah. I've read somewhere that 87.3% of all statistics are made up on the spot. It could be. It could be. <laughs> uh, you know, that's one that's made up. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that, that's, uh, nobody has those kind of figures at their fingertips. But the problem is, if you don't have an answer, they're going to condemn you. So you never have to come across, you never come across not looking like you don't know what you're talking about. You never come across knowing that you don't have the facts at your hands. You have to have that aura of confidence. That's why Reagan was such a popular president. We live in a culture that doesn't respect the truth. We live in a culture where the most people who have the most credibility are people who make a living pretending to be somebody they're not. Actors, for instance. And then when people say, well, how come you got all these actors as spokespersons? Because people believe in them. Because people respect them. You know, Pierce Brosnan is 007. He is, you know, I write, uh, I write some of uh, Pierce's speeches for him, you know, for when he got the Global Green Award and everything. And he asked me one time to write a speech for NATO. And I said, well, NATO? Uh, he says, yeah, I have to give a speech to NATO. I said, why? He says, well, for some strange reason, they think I'm an expert on the Cold War because I played James Bond. So I wrote a speech actually very critical of NATO, and he read it. And the only way he could get out in the door is by doing it that way. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, because he's James Bond. It's really, it, one of the things I always joke with the uh, Sea Shepherd, I said, we've got, uh, we got William Shatner, we've got Pierce Brosnan, we've got Christian Bale, we've got uh, uh, Richard Dean Anderson. And uh, so how can, I said, how can we lose when we got uh, Captain Kirk, uh, James Bond, uh, MacGyver, uh, and Batman, and we also have uh, the President of the United States in Martin Sheen. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty serious cast, isn't it? Yeah, it Tell me about the Br'er Rabbit ploy. What we did with the, um, the Farley Moed in uh, 2008 was what I called the, the Tar Baby Farley Maneuver. <laughs> is we sent the um, Farley Moed into the Gulf of St. Lawrence as the Tar Baby, knowing that Loyola Hearn would overreact. You could read this guy's psychology pretty easily. We knew he would overreact. And uh, in fact, I even said a week before, I said, the best thing that could happen right now is for the Canadian government to attack and seize my ship. But then I said, I don't think they're that stupid. <laughs> but they actually did. And um, so it's what happened is that uh, Loyola punched the ship and got stuck, and he punched it again and got stuck. And now the Farley Mowat sits in Sydney Harbor, and they don't know what to, to do with it. And it's very expensive to retire a vessel. So basically Canada is doing that for me. So everything played out the, exactly the way they thought. So every time they think they're punishing you, they're actually not, if you can control the situation. So the, the story, of course, of Br'er Rabbit is he gets caught by Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear, and he says, you can do anything to me, torture me, kill me, but please, please, please don't throw me into the briar patch. And of course, knowing that that's what he doesn't want, they throw him into the briar patch, which is in fact what he, he wanted. So by, by trying, to, the strategy of trying to tell your enemy that what you don't want is exactly what you want. <laughs> right, right. And the and Canadian government falls for it all the time. I mean, they've done this to me every, all the time. I, the, the advantage we have over Canadian politicians is we've been here longer than they. I've gone through so many fisheries ministers. I know the Department of Fisheries better than the ministers do. And that's only because of years and years of having to oppose them. So these guys come into these portfolios. They really haven't any idea of what they're talking about. And they depend on the bureaucrats, presumably, to tell them what, uh, what they should do next. And the bureaucrats are very biased in favor of the industry. In fact, I always call DFO as the Newfoundland Mafia because it's controlled by Newfoundland uh, 
bureaucrats from Mac, Mac Mercer on, really. You know, so. Well, you know, you make a very interesting point there because one of the things that strikes me about so many environmental issues is that the issues are long-term. They're, in many cases, they're really long-term. And the, the devices that we have as a society or a community to deal with them are very short-term. I mean, we're, we're, the horizon of the politician is three or four or five years, and you can't even begin to scratch the surface of any important issue in that length of time. Yeah. And as environmentalists, we, we, I mean, the seal, the seal hunt's a 40-year war. I mean, it's... And I always felt that our secret to success has to be persistence. You know, never give up, never surrender, just keep plugging along and uh, just keep at it year after year after year and never give up. And uh, they'll have to give up. They'll either retire or they're defeated in an election or whatever. So we're always there and they never are. So we'll outlast them. Yeah. But not the department. No, but the department, uh, we will eventually. We'll be beat them eventually. We win these things always eventually. In fact, uh, with the DFO, uh, I, oh, for years I've had the sort of the weird uh, pleasure, I mean, of, uh, of being able to say I told you so because, you know, we predicted the collapse of the cod fishery in 1980. And every year we said that, and we were always told, oh, you people don't know what you're talking about. I remember doing a debate with a fishery scientist in B.C., and I said, you know, in three years the coho uh, is going to collapse. And he says, watch, and you don't know what you're talking about. We have the best experts in the world, best scientists in the world. You're wrong, sir. You're dead wrong. And I was wrong. It collapsed the next year. These guys do not know what they're talking about. The scientists who work for the DFO, I've, the word I've come up with them is biostitutes. Basically, they come up with the science to justify the politics. You know, the only good scientists are the ones who are employee of universities, like, uh, you know, Pauli or, or Worm or, uh, or, or people like... Uh, Hutchins and Rand Yeah, all, all these guys. Yeah. These are the guys who you listen to. You can't listen to a DFO uh, scientist because if they speak the truth, they're fired, and that's happened. And that's actually, if you were looking for an honor roll of the really good fishery scientists, they would be an enormous number of them are, are alumni of DFO, have been there and have been fired. Yeah, Mitchell's another good one. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, really dedicated scientists. But unfortunately, you know, if you're a marine biologist, there's limited uh, limited possibilities for employment. I always have people say, "I'm going to be a marine biologist." Uh, that's the most common thing that a student says. And I and I, I said, "Well, you know, the problem with being a marine biologist is you've got limited possibilities of how to uh, you know how to be employed, and uh, so you have to keep that into into account." No, and you've got to keep on going year after year after year. You still do have to raise the money. Where does it actually come from? I think our, our organization has grown by word of mouth, and it gets bigger every year. A little bit at a time, but it's still bigger. We're still not that big of an organization. <coughs> we have uh, our budget now is about $3 million a year. It's gone up in the last few years from $1 million. Uh, having our own TV show certainly helps that. But, uh, but we get by because our ships are crewed by volunteers. You know, when people criticize this, you know, your, your crew are all inexperienced. I said, yeah, they are, but I can't buy that kind of passion in with professional sailors. I'm just not going to get it. But for all of that talk about how amateurish we are and everything, in 32 years, I've never lost a crew member. I've never had a crew member injured. I've never put a ship aground. I've never had a single incident with any of my ships. And yet I'm constantly listening to these uh, tin pot skippers from Newfoundland and their little 65 foot long liners telling me how I'm not a real captain, like they are. <laughs> and so it doesn't really mean anything to me. They say, well, you know, you don't have captain's papers. I don't have captain papers and there's a very good reason why I don't have them. They'd take them away from me if I did. So I'm not even going to waste my time on that. I've got over 300 uh, ocean transoceanic voyages under my belt. I don't need the papers to prove that I'm a, I'm a captain. And, uh, you know, I command those vessels, and I command them, I think, responsibly. And, uh, you know, I've been with, involved with ships all my life. I was at the Canadian Coast Guard. I was with the Norwegian Swedish Merchant Marine. I've been with uh, the British Charter Industry, as, and I was with the Canadian Pacific Steamship Companies. I've got that experience commercially. And I was also the first officer in all the Greenpeace voyages originally. So I, I just find it sort of amusing that these uh, fishermen would say things like, oh, well, he's not a real captain. <laughs> and it's not just them. I, it's, that's a fairly common common kind of thing, but you know, uh, I took a boat down from from a much smaller voyage than yours, but uh, but from Cape Breton to the Bahamas, and everywhere I went, I was called captain. Yeah. yeah. As it happened, I did have 40-ton masters to, uh, ticket that had expired about 30 years earlier, but, uh, but you know, anybody who's in command of a ship is called captain of the ship. Right? Yeah. In fact, if you were to go back to the British Navy days, they were not the masters. 
the captains were not the masters. They, they couldn't even navigate the ship for the most part. They were in command. But I, I you know, I command, I navigate my own ships. I'm, I'm in charge of it. So. And uh, I've taken more voyages to the Antarctic than Shackleton, Amundsen, and Scott combined. So I'm, <laughs> I find it just amusing, really, more than anything. I don't get, I don't get uh, put off or, uh, or insulted by it. I just find it amusing. Because you know? I, I really don't care what people think about what I do. You've, uh, you've sunk a number of ships. Tell me a bit about, about that. Uh, we, I hunted down the pirate whaler, the Sierra, in 79, uh, exactly 30 years ago this month. Uh, hunted that down, rammed it off the coast of uh, Portugal. It was repaired and then we scuttled it in Lisbon Harbor, so it never killed another whale. That was on February 6, 1980. We sank half of Spain's whaling fleet in 1981, two of their four ships. Uh, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet, two of their four ships in 1986. Uh, we sunk four Norwegian whalers over the years. I keep sinking them every couple of years to keep their insurance values high. They have to pay, pay war insurance, so it's extremely costly for them. So that's a strategy there, just to keep their, their insurance on high. Uh, we sunk one um, uh, long line, or no, one drift netter in, in Taiwan. And that, so, but we always make sure when we sink the vessels, that none of them are ever sunk at sea, and none of them are ever sunk with anybody on board. I've never sunk a ship with anybody on board. So how do you sink them? What you do is you get into the uh, engine room, you get on board the ship, break your way in, get into the engine room, you dismantle the saltwater or cooling system valves, or shut it down, tear it apart, then open up the valves, like opening what they call the seacocks, and just flood the engine. So basically, yeah. So basically, you just um, allow them to sink by open, opening up a valve and that opens up a hole in the ship. Yeah, yeah the only tool is a monkey wrench. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you know, in Iceland's case, you know, I, I sunk those two ships. And everybody, oh, you're a terrorist and everything. I flew to Iceland. I flew to Reykjavik and demanded that they arrest me. The next day, they told me to leave the country. The minister of justice says, "Who the hell does he think he is? He comes into our country and demands to be arrested. Get him out of here." So they cannot legitimately call me a criminal because they had the opportunity to charge me and put me on trial. They never even charged me for a crime. So I'm not a criminal, no matter what they say. <laughs> well, this is kind of one of your favorite <coughs> techniques, though, isn't it? Is, is to, uh, to basically say, arrest me. I mean, uh, you know, you, you do something, um, they say this is against the law, and it's you know, criminal activity, etc., etc., and, and you show up and basically say, so arrest me. And, and over and over again, they turn away. Yeah, because they do not want to put me on trial for, because Iceland knew that to put me on trial would be put the whole country on trial for illegal whaling. All of this stuff would come out. It would be a big cause. And, I mean, they say, oh, we're not going to play into his hands, <laughs> you know, and everything like that. But uh, in many cases, I'm, I'm confident that if we go into these cases, just like in Newfoundland, when Canada put me on trial, that we're going to win. And I'm confident because I, can, I think I have an understanding of the law that uh, if just based on the law, if there's no politics involved, we're going to win. Of course, the, un the uncertain factor is the politics. You, you, know, you never know where that's going to go. Well, right, and, and, and the politics is, is, is really a part of the law. I mean, one of the things, okay, here's a personal, really personal question, but reading through the New Yorker piece and, and reading a little bit of the account of, your, of your, your family life as a very young person, it occurred to me that what I would have learned from that if I were Paul Watson was that, the, that there are rules, there are laws, there are modes of behavior that are sort of socially appropriate, and if you don't follow them, not much happens in terms of, of, of you know, the, the behavior of your father, for example, right? That, that, uh, and so I, I would go away from that if I were Paul Watson and say, well, what's written and what happens are two completely different things. And it seems to me that the gap between them has been a place where you've spent a lot of your life. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you know, I, I've always said that I have respect for the law, uh, but I think that I respect justice more than the law. <laughs> so, and you put those two together, that sometimes in order to achieve justice, you have to bend the law. I was giving a talk with Bob Hunter years ago at the Canadian Bar Association in, um, at Whistler and, uh, in British Columbia. And uh, one reporter said, you know, breaking the law can never be justified. And I said, okay, uh, the year's 1938, 1939. You see uh, a trainload of Jewish people on their way to a concentration camp. You break in, I mean, and you, you kill the guards, but you free these people. And you, and, you, and you make sure they don't go to their deaths in a concentration camp. Is that justified? And he said, well, they, no, well, that, of course that's justified. That was a fascist government. I said, no, Adolf Hitler was democratically elected by the people of Germany. There is no difference between his government and our government. He was a democratically elected uh, head of government. He wasn't a dictator. So is it justified? And he said, well, that's completely different. I said, why is it different? He couldn't answer the question. So this is an example of where justice takes precedence over the law. The law is not always right. 
Um, it's a question of the spirit of the law must take precedence over the rule of the law. Why was the law put into place? And uh, so you have to challenge the law. And I think that Mahatma Gandhi had the right attitude towards that. You challenge the law, you break it, and you go to court and you stand up for why you did this. And you let the legal system run its course there. I've never run away from any, anything that I've done. I'm always there to say, okay, charge me. Yeah, quite the contrary. If anything, you've run back. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, when uh, I was in uh, Prince Edward Island, when uh, the DFO was trying to have me, um, they wanted a big, uh, massive uh, bail, you know, the judge said, well, there's no evidence here that he's not going to return. In fact, I think he probably wants to return. So she didn't, uh, you know, she didn't put a bail on. It's kind of wonderful, actually. Isn't it? But there is a, there's also the intersection. I mean, somebody, um, there's an old legal maxim which holds that laws are made by those who have the power to enforce them which to me really puts, makes clear the relationship between politics and the law. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before, how I've, I've written about how outraged I am that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans creates criminal activities to prevent protest. I mean, it basically moves the goalposts so that so what was perfectly legal last year is illegal this year. And the whole reason for that is to prevent you from doing a democratic process, protest. Yeah. Right? I remember in 1976, uh, no, no, excuse me, it was 19, 1979 when we first said, went out to put the dye on the seals to destroy the value of the pelts. That was perfectly legal. It was legal when we set off from the boat to do it. Uh, the next morning we're arrested for marking and dyeing live seals. I said, it's not illegal. The Prime Minister passed an order in Council ruling this morning. Well, I'm not aware of that. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, they said. Well, this is ridiculous. I mean, I mean, yeah. the, the law, it also has to do a lot with intent. It wasn't my intent to break the law, because I wasn't even aware that the law existed. So. Well, and, and because it didn't, of course. And, and you know, that, that's, that, that just sort of underlines um, the relationship between politics and law, and that strange, strange intersection. Um, but it really is a matter of, it really is about power. I mean, that's not to say that laws are made to be broken, but... Well, it's the abuse, of, some are, uh, abuse some of the law by politicians, and Canadian right. politicians have been very abusive of the law. That's right. They, there, is a, there is a charge about bringing the law into ridicule and contempt, and you know, I've often thought that in a situation like that, that's precisely what the government has done. And yeah. it goes from prosecution to persecution, really. Yes. Of, yes. And uh, there's no doubt that, uh, it's not just us, uh, any of the groups that have taken a stand on any of these issues, from the seal hunt to the tar sands to whatever, uh, they're being used. The other thing, too, is the penalty is given are more extreme. I mean, if, if you were to go down and uh, rob a star store and burn it down to the ground or something like that, your penalties are less than if you save a seal. Uh, what was it? Uh, I remember when I was, uh, I was sentenced to uh, 1979 for what I did. Uh, no, 1983. I was charged with breaking the Seal Protection Act and conspiracy to break the Seal Protection. In fact, I was uh, convicted of conspiracy with myself because nobody else was implicated. And I was given 15 months in prison for conspiracy and six months for breaking the Seal Protection Act. And I got into Orsonville Prison in Quebec and the guy next to me was on manslaughter charge doing 18 months. And I said, what'd you do? I said, mm, save some seals. You know, but uh, nine days later we, we won the appeal, got the whole thing overturned. But uh, the judge we had, Judge uh, Yvonne Mercier, my strategy with him, I knew when we went into his courtroom he was going to throw the book at us. We knew it. I mean, he was, we called him the hanging, uh, the Judge Roy Bean of Quebec. and. Uh, so the strategy we came up with, and the lawyers agreed, was to be as deliberately hostile to this judge as possible. We wanted to make him mad. And the madder he got, the harsher he was going to be. We wanted him to throw the books at us. And he did. He just overreacted. He char 21 months for me, 7 months for my chief engineer, $3,000 fines for everybody, $75,000 fine for me, confiscation of my ship, uh, oh, and the, my favorite one. You're not to correspond directly with, or indirectly with any journalist anywhere in the world on any subject for three years. And uh, so nine days later, I got released on uh, the appeal, held a press conference, threw it in his face, and we won the appeal. Because uh, it was just outrageous. Well, the, well, the, the, the penalties he gave us were way above what was out of it. And, 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 and the upper court recognized that. You know? So I, I do have the faith that at some level there is a justice <laughs> that's going to take place. Yeah, I think that the Supreme Court or uh, uh, upper court judges tend to be a little more aware of their place in history than the lower court judges. They have a little broader view, I, think, I sometimes think. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there's the tar baby again, right? I mean, this is really a key strategy for Paul Watson, isn't it? The tar baby. Make him punch the tar baby. And 
and uh, and then they get and then they get stuck. Yeah, it yeah. works. <laughs> yeah, absolutely it does. And I'm surprised they haven't caught on. <laughs> You've also gotten into some um, some difficulty by basically um, taking the view that our species has no special rights on the earth. Tell me uh, about that. My philosophy is one of biocentrism, that uh, we are just one of millions of species on this planet, and I don't believe that any one species is any more important than any other species because there's three basic laws of ecology, the law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it, the law of interdependence, that those species are interdependent with each other, and the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth, a limit to carrying capacity. Those are the three basic laws, and any species throat the planet's history that hasn't lived in accordance with those three laws has gone extinct. And we will be no different. You can only break those laws for so long. So therefore we need diversity. And the crime that we're committing right now is the destruction of diversity. I think that's the most serious thing we're doing right now is uh, diminishing diversity on the planet. We're living in a period which is now actually defined by scientists as the Homocene as a major extinction event. And uh, we're responsible for that. Uh, but those species are interdependent. So we don't know when we remove one species what that impact is going to have on other species and also upon ourselves. When I was teaching at UCLA, I gave my students uh, a choice. The life of one human being or the extinction of an unknown species of bacteria. And to make it easy, it's a cute little baby. Does the baby die so that the species survives or do we exterminate the species to save the life of the baby? An anthropocentric mindset would say, well, a human life is worth more than any species of bacteria. Or any... I've actually had a reporter said all the redwoods in the world aren't worth the life of one human being. And I said, well, then why do we kill so many loggers cutting them down? But uh, so invariably, an anthropocentric mindset will choose the life of the baby. And then I reveal the unknown species of bacteria is the microflora that lives in your gut that allows you to digest your food. So your choice has now exterminated the human race, thus illustrating the law of interdependence. And uh, we have to be aware of that, of that law. And uh, as John Muir once said, tug on any part of nature and you'll find it intimately connected to every other part. And I, I firmly believe that, so we're not any different. I mean, we have been on this planet for such a fraction of time compared to the history of this planet. In fact, if you put the entire history of the Earth into one year, we were here for the last two seconds. <laughs> so there's a whole year of history went ahead of us. And, and in fact, the dinosaurs didn't even appear until late November. So uh, people just, I, I just find it the height of arrogance for the human species to say this was all created for humanity. I mean, what kind of fairy tale is this? It's, uh, it's just amazing. Or as Mark Twain once described, up on the top of the Eiffel Tower, there's a little blister of paint. And that little blister of paint thinks that the Eiffel Tower was built so it could sit there, <laughs> you know. And uh, so I do challenge that, and it goes, so of course people take uh, exception to that because most people live in a fantasy world of, uh, of our own creation, which is these uh, anthropocentric fairy tales that we adhere to, which is, for another word, is called religion. And uh, you know, when people believe in this kind of thing, it's pretty hard to talk logic. Yeah. You, uh, you commented one time, and, and I guess you just explained that one completely, that or something to the effect that, that uh, you know, you did not see the Mona Lisa, for example, as a sacred object, and you didn't see vandalizing human creations as being a major crime, right? I, well, mean, I, I, I may be distorting what you said there. But. Well, I certainly think that the, the destruction of something like the Mona Lisa or, uh, you know, Michelangelo's David or something like that is a, is a crime, but it doesn't compare to the crimes that we commit against nature. Uh, if you were to walk into, say, the city of Mecca and spit on the black stone, you're not going to walk out of that city alive. You're going to be ripped apart and everybody will accuse you of blasphemy and the violence against you will be justified. Or walk into Jerusalem with a, whaling, with a pickaxe and start hang, hacking away at the wailing wall. You're going to get an Israeli soldier's bullet in the back and everybody will say you deserved it. You attack something which is sacred. But each and every day we go into the most profoundly sacred, mysterious cathedrals of the world. The redwood forests of Amazonia or the, the temperate rainforests of British Columbia. And we totally destroy these cathedrals with bulldozers and chainsaws. And, and how do we respond? A few petitions here, a few letters of protest, a few people jump, dress up in animal costumes and jump around with picket signs. But if the Amazonian rainforest or the coral, great coral barrier reef off of Australia or the temperate rainforests of uh, Vancouver Island were as sacred to us, if we loved and respected and revered that as much as a hunk of old meteorite in Mecca or a, or a decrepit old wall in Jerusalem, we would literally rise up and tear, you know, uh, violently oppose this because we justify violence when it's in the name of what we believe in. And uh, so therefore we'll kill in defense of an old wall, but we 
we won't kill in defense of an ecosystem. We'll kill for oil. <laughs> you know, when people say to me, how can you have people risk their life to protect whales? I said, why is that so unusual? People are dying right now protecting oil wells in Iraq. That, I think that to risk your life and to die in the cause of saving an endangered species or an ecosystem is a far more noble endeavor than dying for an oil well. But again, it's all a question of values. After a break, my conversation with Paul Watson continued at his office. I want to go back to the Sierra, the, the original sinking of the Sierra. Just put me in that picture a little bit, because all I know is that there was a, I, I see the gash in one of the paintings that you have, and, and, uh, but I don't really know the story. Well, like what actually happened there? <coughs> the Sierra was um, a pirate whaling vessel that was operating throughout the late 60s and throughout the 70s. And um, when I was with Greenpeace, I was trying to get Greenpeace interested in going after it, but there wasn't much interest. So after I secured the Sea Shepherd and we did the SEAL campaign, uh, I was in Bermuda and the ship was pretty much mine to do with what I wanted at that point. So I decided that now was the opportunity to go after the Sierra. I brought the ship up to Boston to recruit a crew and to uh, get everything ready for it. Then um, on July 1st, I believe, we set out from, uh, from Boston and stopped briefly in the Azores and uh, had no idea where to find the ship. I knew it was somewhere between the north of Portugal and halfway down the coast of Africa. But uh, it was one of those things you went out on blind faith. I just felt that I was going to find this thing. And as we left uh, Horta in the Azores, uh, the next day I had to stop the ship for about 12 hours because there's this migration of loggerhead turtles. They, they were in front of me and didn't want to risk running them down. So we just stopped the ship and swam with the turtles and uh, just carried on. And, and the next day at noon, I saw a ship and it was going south. And um, as I got closer, I saw a big S on the funnel. And I really couldn't believe it was the ship that we were looking for, 200 miles off the coast of Portugal, between there. If it wasn't for the turtles, would have missed them completely. The turtles actually stopped us enough time, just the right time, to allow us to intersect the course line of them going south. It was almost a mystical experience in a way. So um, I started chasing the Sierra, and they started running. and. Uh, I couldn't do anything there because the, um, the seas were so rough. <coughs> so I chased them for 20 hours uh, into the northern coast of uh, Portugal and into the port of La Chose. And uh, they were there and I went alongside and they were at anchor. And uh, then I heard they were going to leave and I said, look, well, we can't allow that. Uh, and, uh, but I couldn't get clearance. I said, well, we're gonna have to go without clearance. And uh, I, t I called the crew together and I said, look, I can't say you're not going to get hurt, but I can guarantee you're going to go to jail in Portugal. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to get away with this, but sometimes you just got to do these things. And so, but I'm not going to force anybody to do anything they don't want to do. So you have a choice. You got 10 minutes to get off the ship or else you're coming with us. 17 of them got off. So I only had two crew, but fortunately both were engineers, especially Peter Wolf, chief engineer, and Jerry Doran, who was from the U.S. Peter was from Australia. And so we um, let go of the lines and we headed out uh, across the harbor, kept picking up speed. I went straight at the Sierra as uh, full speed and struck it on the bow to give them a warning about what I was doing. I was trying to damage the harpoon. Then did a 360 degree turn and came in on an angle to hit them uh, midship or just behind their forepeak and split them down open to the water line and uh, then took off. The real damage was caused because they started the engine from dead stop to full speed ahead to get away from us, burned the bearings right out of their engine, just limped into, into the dock. Then we took off and uh, we, <coughs> we took off and then we were pursued by a, a Portuguese naval vessel. And I learned a lesson there. I shouldn't have stopped, but I didn't, you know, I was really inexperienced at that point because I found out later he wouldn't have fired on us, but uh, he threatened to. So we went back into the shows and uh, I was brought before the port captain. I was charged with gross criminal negligence. I said, well, there isn't anything negligent about what I did. I hit the guy exactly where I intended to hit him. That's not negligence. And um, the poor captain sort of laughed at that. And he says, my real problem is, I don't know who owns that ship. I can't figure it out. And uh, until I do, you're free to go. So I just walked out the door. And one of my crew members said, well, if I knew you were going to get away with it, I would have been there too. <laughs> but there's two lessons I learned there. One was, you do these things because they have to be done. You can't be too concerned about whether you're going to get away with it or not. And two, uh, I was no longer afraid of Navy vessels. So in 81, when we were pursued by the Soviet Navy, I refused to stop. 
and I refused to stop for the Norwegian Navy again in in ninety four. And they're not going to take any. You, know, you, you are in a sense calling, the, calling their bluff, and they're not going to go and sink a. Well, I learned uh, something about navies. Wouldn't do this with the U.S. Navy, but they're all different. But red tape. When we uh, we land nineteen eighty one, we landed on the beach in Siberia to to film and document illegal whaling activities. We were the first people to invade Russia since World War II. And it was an invasion. We simply landed on the beach. And there were two Soviet soldiers patrolling the beach. And the evidence was right there. They were killing whales for fur farms. We, 45 minutes, we documented everything. The soldiers did nothing because they assumed we had to be Russians. Who else would be landing on the beach? And from one mile distance where the ship was, was a British ensign, which looked like the Russian flag. So all they could see was a red flag. And uh, so we filmed everything. And they didn't seem to be too inquisitive until uh, I went to get back into the boat. And I was pushing the boat and a Soviet soldier came up and he said, Что uh, это? I said, это Zodiac. It's a, it's a Zodiac. And he says, это Mercury. And that's when I realized that we were in trouble because it was a Mercury outboard engine. So I turned my back to him quickly and I began pushing the boat. And I said to the two, there's a UPI photographer, Eric Schwartz, and uh, one of my crew. I said, what's he doing? He says, well, he's taking his gun down. I says, well, smile and wave at him. You know, like that, like you're, you know, it's perfectly natural, which they did. And um, that confused him. So he didn't know what to do. And I pushed the boat out, got in, and we motored back uh, to the ship. We saw him running up towards the town. And uh, we were feeling pretty good about it. We got the evidence. We're on our way down the coast of Siberia. And about, ooh, an hour later, two helicopter gunships came out of nowhere and started firing flares across uh, the bow. And then shortly thereafter, a big Soviet frigate <laughs> pull, comes in. They're chasing us down. They pull up alongside, and the captain gets on the radio and said, uh, Sea Shepherd, stop your ship immediately and be prepared to board, boarded by the Soviet Union. And I said, Well, uh, we don't have room for the Soviet Union. We're not stopping. He didn't know how to deal with that, no, because I knew what was going through his mind. What is this ship? If I fire on this ship and I make a mistake, I'm in big trouble. So his whole thing was to get orders from Moscow. He's not going to make any order, and that bought us the time to get a, to get back over onto the U.S. side of the the, the line. Mm -hmm. He chased us right to the line, and then he back uh, he backed off. So that was, uh, the, and then we found that again in the Norwegians in '94, they were pursuing us, and the captain says, "I have it from the highest authority in Norway to do whatever it takes to stop you." And I said, uh, "We'll do it." <laughs> he said, no, you don't understand. I have it from the highest authority in Norway to do whatever it takes to stop you. I said, well, then you have it from the highest authority. Do it. He says, well, I'm going to fire on your ship. I said, you're going to fire on our ship. And he did. He fired in front of us. He fired over top of us. He said, I'm going to put a shell into your ship. If, anybody, if anybody's killed, it's your fault. I said, no, you're pulling the trigger. If anybody's killed, it's your, your fault. And uh, then my crew lined the side of the ship you know, and said, OK, fire. And uh, we called his bluff, basically, and he wasn't prepared to kill anybody. So, you know, they're Norwegians after all, they're not complete barbarians. You know? <laughs> right. you know, so, um, so anyway, we were able to, uh, to, to get, but he chased us for 500 miles all the way to the Orkney Islands. Yeah. Yeah. He did ram us, he did damage yeah. us, and he dropped four depth charges underneath of us. But, uh, and we got it all on film, too. But my first officer was Norwegian, he is former Norwegian Navy, and he looked at me and says, they don't know how to, they don't know what to do with no. All of their lives, these people have been conditioned that when you show up, you surrender. I mean, because of a big armed Navy ship. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes, sure, sure, good. Something we touched on in the truck, um, the Paul Watson story, the, the film of the Paul Watson story. We've <laughs> sold the um, options uh, from 1981 on that until this year. So every year they, somebody buys the options. So Tony Bill from Warner Brothers bought it in 81, and now it's with Peter Cronenberg. So, uh, I don't know if they ever make the movie, but they keep buying the rights to it. <laughs> Which is one of the things that keeps the organization, uh, helps the organization out some, I would think. It's about $50,000 a, a year in option yeah, money. It's yeah. enough to hire a person, right? Yeah. 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 Good. Um, one, one, uh, one other sort of major recent controversy, it seems to me, is, is your suggestion that the population being reduced to a billion. Mm -hmm. What did you actually say about that, and what, and what do you actually think about that? Well, it's not, I wasn't actually saying it should be, I was saying it will be. Uh, in the 21st century, we will experience uh, peak oil, uh, and once we do that, there's going to be a collapse, because our entire society is uh, 
is uh, really built on cheap oil and cheap energy. It's not just the fuel for the vehicles, but it's also the fertilizer to feed billions of people. Uh, and those population is doubled since 1950. When it was three billion, it's now almost seven billion. It's more than doubled in one generation. I mean, where, where is this going to stop? And it's one of the laws of ecology, the law of finite resources. There's a limit to carrying capacity. We're literally stealing the carrying capacity of other species. They have to go extinct for our numbers to increase as we take over their resources. So once oil peaks, uh, there's going to be a lot of chaos involved and uh, more wars, more domestic wars, uh, certainly famine. Uh, and I think what that's going to result in is a situation that by 100 years from now, there will be a billion people on this planet and no more because I don't think that this planet is capable of supporting more than a billion people unless it has that source of energy. Mm -hmm. uh, wind and solar are good, but uh, it's not, it can't maintain those numbers. In fact, I look on the world of, say, 2110, 100 years from now, is more resembling 1810. We're back to sailing ships, horses, and uh, windmills. And living basically on, on uh, energy income as opposed to energy capital. Absolutely, and I think that we're going to... Uh, you know, be looking at communities of no more than 20,000 in any grade, and the big cities won't last. Uh, this is, we, you know, we, we've had the uh, opportunity or the privilege of living in the greatest time in world history for material resources. Between, say, 1800 and 2130, probably, there will never be like anything like that again. The, the resources are so plentiful. We've exploited entire continents to get it, and the only continent left is Antarctica, and they'll probably go to war over that. So uh, the world has a limited capacity, and that's what I think we have to understand. And uh, so I think that I don't think that people should. Uh, I know, you know, of course, that immediately got interpreted by the right-wing press here in the United States as uh, Watson advocates the extermination of five billion people. I said no such thing. I said that what we have to do is find a, a voluntary solution where we can reduce populations over the next two generations. And how do we do that? I don't know. I'd get the Nobel Prize if I could find out how to do that. Yeah, I, that was my next question is, is there any um, um, peaceable way to do that? Well, I think that we could. There is way, of course, I mean, by voluntarily reducing uh, populations. But, of course, as soon as you start talking about that, then you're right into the realm of being accused of fascism or Nazism or everything. I always find it interesting every time I talk about population reduction, I'm accused of being a Nazi when the Nazis, in fact, uh, were doing everything they could to increase population, except, of course, mm. Germans <laughs> and yeah. that. But uh, they weren't, uh, you know, the, in fact, it was the, the patriotic duty of a German woman to be pregnant on that. But we have the same situation now because our entire economic um, system is based on unlimited growth. People, they need people to buy things. I think Jean Chrétien said it right in a debate. He says, well, we cannot stop immigration, for instance, because th these people come in and they buy a car and they buy a refrigerator and they buy a house and that's what keeps the economy going. Well, he's right, but that's also destroying the planet on that. I get accused of you know, being anti-immigrant uh, when I just say, well, look, you know, all I'm saying is that when somebody comes into the United States, they increase their ecological footprint by 50 times. You know, they come from a, a, country, a third world country and they suddenly their material, uh, you know, uses of materials increase by 50 times. So it's not one person coming in, it's now 50 people coming in for every one. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just a limit to that growth. And um, then, of course, immediately you're called a, racism, but a racist. But I said, there's nothing racist about it. I'm not talking about race. I'm talking about purely about numbers. I had the San Francisco Chronicle call me up when we were doing the Sierra Club debate over immigration. They said, what do you got against Mexicans? I said, nothing. I said, I don't care if California is 100% Mexican. It used to be. What the hell? You know? <laughs> In fact, I like Mexican food better than American food. But that's not the point. It's numbers. It's completely numbers. It's got nothing to do with, with race. And um, so people just don't understand that. You know? And uh, when it comes to procreation, I'm not against people having children. I, uh, in fact, uh, but I do think, and this is really controversial that people should have a prescription to have a child because uh, just it's the easiest thing anybody can do anybody can have a child any child molester alcoholic drug abuser can have a child mm -hmm. and I don't think the problem is uh, people having children it's the wrong people having children and people say well who are you to determine what the wrong person is well a child abuser an alcoholic a drug abuser these are people who shouldn't have children and well, but to get into deal with the population issue was way beyond that. I mean, you know, you're yeah. really talking about you know huge segments of the population not reproducing and and yeah. 
you know, you're talking about, uh, yeah, a very, very small uh, cohort being born in the next couple of generations. Right? I think that nobody should have a child unless they can prove that the, for the next 18 years they can give that child everything that that child requires, education, love, nourishment, everything that it needs. And unfortunately, you know, it doesn't matter whether you have six children or one child, it's how you raise that child. So what's happened is 90% of the children being born are really not being, you know, born into a life where they can be guaranteed those things. And I think the problems we have in our society is based on unwanted, unloved, undereducated, undernourished children. And, uh, you know, I find it really interesting in the right wing in America says that, uh, you know, they're pro-capital punishment, but they're anti-abortion. You know, so, and what happened, who ends up on death row? Unwanted, unloved, uneducated children. And that, it's really interesting, if you take a look at the statistics of, uh, from 1972 in Roe versus Wade, it's interesting that today we have a lower crime rate now than we did 20 years ago. And the reason for that is that four million abortions. Four million people who would now be in this country at an age between 20 and 30, who would have been a good percentage of them, not all of them, a good percentage of them, would have been raised in an atmosphere of the unloved, uneducated, and unwanted, and therefore a criminal class. What makes a criminal class is unloved and unwanted, uneducated children. And so I think that, in fact, the crime rate has decreased for precisely mm -hmm. that reason. And um, so I think that uh, people should take a course and earn the right to prove that they're capable of being a proper parent. I think it's the most awesome responsibility that anybody can have is to be a parent. It's more responsible than anything else. But I still think we're, we're, we're avoiding the original point, which was that five people out of six on the earth ought not to be here, if we're, or will not be here, or there, you yeah. know, there will only be one billion out of the six, out of the present six, and, and at the end of the century. And I'm, I guess my, my, my continuing question is, is there any way that that can be done short of some kind of economic, ecological, military, yeah. whatever, but some catastrophic series of events to wipe out that 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 huge bulge in the population? Yeah, is I'm not. There any, is there? A, I'm not saying that we should have that. No, but no, I'm saying I'm, we I'm, will have that. And I know. And, and you're and I don't, you're, I don't you're making it. a prediction. Yeah. You're not making a prescription. I understand yeah. that. But my point is, my uh, my question, I guess, is: Is there any cons imaginable way for that to happen? other than by catastrophe, you know, and I, I think it's a good question. I think that uh, I would like to see an answer to that, but then again, if I had an answer, I'd probably get the Nobel Prize for it. Yeah. But yeah. right now I see the only answer is one of, um, of a series of events that will be catastrophic, and uh, the, uh, just, you know, the rise and fall of peak oil. Uh, it's pretty much the one thing in the Bible that actually was a good description in Revelations, uh, the four horses of the apocalypse, which is famine, war, domestic strife. I don't know what the other one is. But <laughs> the um, but these things are going to be... Disease. They're, they're, disease. They're going to be the direct result of, of the, the, the collapse of peak oil, I think. And also mm -hmm. the fact that uh, other resources, water especially, water is probably the most, you know, probably the most priceless commodity on the planet. We treat it like... It's uh, nothing. It mean, runs through our hands like water. <laughs> <laughs> but it is water. People don't really understand what water is. Water is the most important element in the universe. It's what makes life possible. It's also, um, it goes contrary to all the laws of nature. You know, it's heavier as a liquid than it is as a solid, and therefore that's the reason the, the oceans don't freeze. Uh, it even forgets itself sometimes, you know, if you go out and it's 20 degrees out uh, Fahrenheit, you know, throw a pebble in a pond to get it to freeze. It, oh, you like wake it up. It doesn't freeze automatically at freezing point. So it, there, it, it's a really an interesting uh, element. And I think what it, I, I see it as blood. It's the blood of the earth. It performs the same function as the blood in our bodies. Our blood takes nutrients to the cells and takes away waste. Water does the same on land. It takes nutrients to the land. It removes the, the, the waste. And uh, it deposits the waste in the estuaries, and, which are the liver and the kidneys of the earth. It puts it into the ocean. The, cloud, the sun pulls it up again. It's a circulatory system. It's just circulating all the time, bringing nutrients to the land and taking away waste. It's the exact same system. When you put a dam on a river, it's like cutting off an artery. You stop the nutrient flow. You stop the waste from taking a place. That's why people are actually seriously talking about blowing the Great Aswan Dam in Egypt. It's destroyed the Nile. The Nile's no longer bringing the resort, the nutrients down, and or, uh, and the and the waste, removing the waste. 
And if we start to look on the world as our own body and see that the plankton and the and the forests are our lungs, and uh, it's all it's all it's all similar in that way. And that's the way I look on the earth as this living organism made up of millions of different species interacting, interdependent, and all equally important. So when somebody says to me, "Well, you know, are you saying that uh, this species of animal is less is more important than people?" I'm saying no, but it's not any less important. And that's very hard for people to uh, to understand. Well, it gets people saying that um, just or thinking of you as misanthropic. Oh, well, I am misanthropic. <laughs> okay, that was the next question I was going to ask you. Is it fair to say Paul Watson is misanthropic? Yeah, I am. I mean, when somebody say, uh, somebody accused me of racism, I, once I said, "Don't accuse me of racism." I I just like everybody equally. <laughs> I don't have any bias <laughs> and that, but um, I believe that anthropocentric uh, humanity is the uh, is destroying this planet and in the process destroying ourselves. So I think that uh, is all summed up in that old comic strip Pogo, we have met the enemy and it is us. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we're in a very interesting situation. We have to fight ourselves in order to survive, which is a complex sort of thing to do. Yeah. But I always feel that by putting the laws of nature ahead of everything else, that that's the key to, to our, uh, our survival. Well, it's ultimately what has to happen, whether we like it or not, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's all summed up with that Earth's first logo, the Earth, Mother Nature bats last. I mean, she gets final say. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And I don't think, uh, people are in denial. They're in denial, of, I mean, they're still in denial about global warming or climate change, and they're in denial about, you know. And the other thing is we, we forget. We wipe out a species and forget that it ever existed. That really bothers me more than anything else. The sea mink is extinct. The Carolina parakeet is extinct. The Newfoundland wolf, the giant auk. There used to be a walrus on the coast of... Uh, of Nova Scotia, there used to be uh, beluga whales in Long Island Sound and uh, the, the Atlantic gray whale, all gone, 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 and just in the last few centuries, and, and we've forgotten. Uh, we, we just adapt to diminishment. We're constantly adapting to diminishment. That's going to be our undoing. You know, if 1966, if I had to said to people, you know, in 30 years you're going to be buying water in plastic bottles and paying more for that water than the equivalent amount of gasoline, everybody look at you like you're stupid. Nobody's going to buy water. And yet I was in a hotel a couple of weeks ago and there was one liter of water for $12.50. Who would pay $12.50 for a liter of water? But they do it. I mean, it's adaptation to diminishment. When I was in a fish market and see, um, see turbot on sale for 28 euros a kilo, I mean, that's amazing. This was an animal that 20 years ago was considered a trash fish. It was considered worthless. But this is the fish you get on a Parisian menu today. So it's a constant adaptation to diminishment. And uh, that's really going to be our undoing, I think. How do you avoid despair? I think that it goes back to the point where, um, you know, when I sort of looked into that whale's eye and I came to the realization that uh, humanity was insane in a way. Uh, and then I just realized that, uh, you know, you can't really despair over it. You just have to accept it and do your best. There's an old Plains Indian um, f f way of thinking, which is you don't do what you do because you're going to win. And you can't focus on winning or losing. You can only focus on doing what is right. You can only do it because it's the right thing to do, the just thing to do. That's all you can really focus on. So I never really think about winning or losing. I just, persistence and carrying on doing what, what we're doing. I, I, and also I, I seem to have a psychology where I don't, uh, I don't really have uh, extremes in emotions. I don't get really hyper. I don't get really, de I've never been depressed in my life. And it's just it's sort of like a constant flow like that. I don't get into fights, I don't lose my temper, I don't, you know, this kind of thing. If you were susceptible to despair, you'd be in the wrong business, that's, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know. but you must surely sometimes look at something like the, um, um, well, and I said to Margie, you know, when we were talking about my coming over here, Margie said, you know the one question I would ask him, and I said, what's that? And she said, uh, uh, has he imagined a world without whales? And no. what was that like? Well, I wouldn't want to live in a world without whales. And I feel saddened by the fact that there's so many species that have gone that are, that, that are no longer here. Uh, so that, that really is a cause for, you know, a sadness, really. It's not a despair, it's a sadness. And uh, no, I couldn't imagine, imagine a world without, that we wiped out the whales. I also think that whales are more intelligent than people. I think that uh, we have the possibility of learning so much from them if we can just break that interspecies communications barrier. I find it amazing that we spend billions of dollars searching through the universe for extraterrestrial life. 
yet here we have intelligent life on the planet that we don't spend anything on trying to communicate with. Scientists just go nuts when they find, uh, though there might be the possibility of a microbe on Europa. On Europa. Well, well, meanwhile, they're wiping out species after species. So we're destroying life on this planet while we're frantically looking for the possibility of life elsewhere. I just find that very, very strange. But uh, whales are, and elephants and other creatures are non-manipulative intelligences. They don't have our abilities, which is a primate ability of hand-to-eye -to -hand -to coordination, the ability to make tools. And because of that, we've uh, been able to manipulate our environment and fill that particular niche. But that doesn't make us any more intelligent. The brain size is pretty much a good indication of intelligence. Um, the human brain is 1,300 cubic centimeters, the orca brain is 6,000 cubic centimeters, and the sperm whale brain, the largest brain to have ever evolved on the planet, is 9,000 cubic centimeters. Largest brain ever. You don't develop a brain unless there's a reason for that. And all cetacean brains are four lobe brains compared to our mammalian three lobe brains from mice to men are all three lobe brains. That's a, the most complex brain on the planet. It's got to mean something. And I think that their abilities on communications and everything are far greater than ours. And when people say, I, I, was, I was debating a NASA scientist one time, he says, well, you know, they'll never be able to explore space. And I'm going, well, why would they want to? If you're perfectly happy with who you are and where you are. As T.S. Eliot once said, man shall never cease from exploration, but the end result of all of his searching will be back where he began in the first place, only this time he'll know where he is. And whales and dolphins know where they are. They don't have to go searching through space. And, uh, but we're inquisitive. Uh, we're primates. Basically, we're a bunch of overly conceited naked apes who are divine legends in our own mind, is really what it comes down to it. And all primates, from monkeys up through the great apes and everything, tend to be extremely selfish as a group of animals. Primates are selfish animals. Yeah. And we're no different than, than that. One of the things I, I try to get across with, with Sea Shepherd is that, uh, that we, what's going to make a difference is individuals. It's, uh, you know, so what we try to encourage and set by example is that, to tell people that each and every one of you can, can make a difference, that uh, a movement is built on diversity of talents and abilities and imagination. So uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a writer or a lawyer or a teacher, an artist and everything. You use your gifts, your abilities and your skills and put it into the service of making a better world. And that's the kind of diversity and interdependence that's going to make a, a successful movement. So it's not all about ramming whaling ships and uh, you know, spiking trees and doing things like that. You know, that's sort of on the radical end of the spectrum because the whole movement goes from uh, from very mainstream to what's considered radical. So you could have, like, it doesn't matter whether your approach is litigation, legislation, education, direct action, civil disobedience, as long as you're contributing to the same common objective. And I think it's through that spectrum of, of diversity that a strong movement is built on. The Green Interview is co-produced and directed by Chris Beckett with the generous cooperation of Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.